Good morning. Welcome again to the services of the Parish Church of Christ. We're so glad that you're here today. If you've not already done so, please take a card and fill it out from the pew in front of you so that we can have a record of your attendance. Thank you for participating in that singing. So good to sing those songs together in praise to our God. Thank you, Henry, for leading us. God's family. Every time I sing that song, I think about uh, Brother Jack Farber from the Forest Park congregation where I grew up. Anytime we would have a singing night, Jack would always pick that song first, and he would lead every verse. And he, you better uh, hurry up, because he's going to leave you in the dust on that one. But uh, he was part of the family, part of a family together. According to the American Psychological Association in 2015, two of the five main causes of stress in the life of American adults are related to family. Everybody knows that keeping a family happy and healthy and whole is an everyday challenge. And we understand that even though this challenge is complicated and difficult, it is not impossible. And so as we think about families, we think about the importance of family, the support that we provide for one another, the love that we have for one another, and that God has given us a precious gift by designing the family. He designed the family, and he designed the church as well. And both the family and the church are founded upon the same principles and use essentially the same framework. And so over the next several Sundays, we're going to be talking about God's family. God's family of the church and God's design for the physical family. And matters that relate to how we can build each other up as the people of God, both in the church and in our homes. The Christian has been given the word of God so that we are not without instruction. So that when we face challenges, whether it's in the church or in the physical family, we're not without support. This doesn't mean that we won't have problems. It doesn't mean that those problems go away, but it does mean that we have help and support. And so this morning, as we begin our series on God's family, I wanna notice this biblical truth that the people of God through Jesus Christ, the church, are God's family. And so first we're going to look at the one family of God, and then we're going to look at those who comprise the one family of God. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, this of Jesus, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Through Jesus Christ, there is one spiritual family. You know, people like to divide. We like to create barriers. We like to put up walls. We like to suggest that some are better than others. You know, I was thinking about uh, that very famous play, Romeo and Juliet. You're either a Montague or you're a Capulet. We like to divide. And it was no different in the situation that Paul addressed in the book of Ephesians, that there were those who believed that they were superior because they were of a Jewish stock, very similar in some ways to the conversation we've been having on Sunday mornings in our class on Galatians. But what Paul says here is whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, doesn't matter because God has made one family. He has made one spiritual family through Jesus Christ. Now the fact that there is one means that there are not many. The fact that there is one means that not everyone is part of that family. In fact, according to the Bible, only some are part of God's one family. In the introduction to the Gospel of John, John begins by describing 
in a very poetic way, Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But he goes on to say that the Word came to his own, in verse 11, and his own did not receive him. But, verse 12, to those who did receive him, who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right, Jesus gave the right, to become children of God. Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, what did John say? Those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Not everyone received him. His own, John said in verse 11, did not receive him. Now this is a very difficult truth because we just said God is not the one who divides. Man is the one who divides. Man is the one who likes to put up walls. Man is the one who likes to use labels. But God brought peace through Jesus Christ. Peace that Jesus himself preached. But at the same time, even though Jesus came and he preached peace and he made peace through the blood of his cross and created the one spiritual family does not mean that everyone has made the decision to be part of that family because not everyone has accepted Jesus. And that's difficult, isn't it? You know, when I was in college, I was studying with one of my classmates and we were talking first about the authority of Scripture because this person had grown up in an environment where Scripture was not authoritative, where they did not believe that the Bible was the final word on spiritual matters, and so we began there. And I said, if a person doesn't accept and obey the Bible, they can't belong to God. Well, now, wait a minute. They said, what about the person in Timbuktu? What about those over the world who haven't heard of Jesus? And those are legitimate questions. Those are difficult questions. But friends, we can't do anything but accept what God has given us in His Word. So we can, we can work with those questions, but the fact is, there are those who have not accepted the message of salvation. There are those who have rejected Jesus. And so there is one spiritual family... And only those who belong to Jesus are part of that family, the church. And in that family, there is peace. Now, having said that, let's take a closer look at the members of God's family. First, we find God the Father. God the Father. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 9, Jesus says, Call no man your father on earth, for you have one Father who is in heaven. Now that's in a, in a series of statements that Jesus makes that all come back to the, this realization that God alone has authority. But this is true in a couple of ways, that God is the Father. God is the Father of all mankind. My brother Marshall Keeble used to say, if I mess a man in Christ, I'll hit him in Adam. In other words, even though we may not all belong to the one spiritual family, we were all created in the image of God. And in that sense, we are all brothers and sisters. In that sense, we all have one Father, God, who created us and made us in His image. But more importantly, God is the one Father in the spiritual sense. And this means that He is the head of the household. This means that He has all authority over the household, over the children, over the siblings. There are many who would try to take that authority... There are those who would try to apply it to themselves. And you look at the Catholic Church and the Pope. Well, there are times when the Pope speaks and is said to be the voice of God, but it's not the voice of God, it's the voice of a man. And when he takes that authority upon himself, he sins. But you know, I think that's probably not the way that most of us experience someone trying to take God's place. It's far more likely that we have experienced someone in the local body who would try, through one means or another, to take God's authority upon themselves. Now, I'm not talking about 
uh, following the biblical pattern for elders and deacons and preachers, I'm talking about any Christian who would try to change what Scripture says. They take what should be God's authority alone. And so in the family of God, there is one father. He is a father who cares for his children. He's referred to often in the Old Testament as the father of the fatherless, and we praise God for that. Now, I was very blessed in this life to have a father who was present and who cared about me and who trained me to love God and his word, but not everyone has been given that blessing. And yet everyone is able, through faith, to call upon the one Father God. And to know that He is always there, that He will never forsake His children, that He loves His children, that He has compassion for His children, and that, his best, that He has His children's best interest at heart always. And so God is the one Father of the Christian family. And although He is the Father, He has given authority to his son. And we're going to talk more about the son in a moment. But in Matthew chapter 28, following Jesus' life on earth, his ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his final appearance with the disciples in Matthew chapter 28, he comes to them and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Do you see what Jesus says there? All authority has been given to me. How is that the case? Has he taken the place of the Father? Has the Father left the family? No, but Jesus as the head of the church, according to Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, Jesus as the head of the church has authority over the church. And as the head of the church, all things in heaven and earth fall under his power. He's not taking God's place, but he serves with the authority that God has given to him as the son of but also as the one with authority over the spiritual family. And so that being the case... What do we know about the one son? We go back to John's introduction. John's introduction there in chapter 1. Not everyone received him. But it, those who did, he gave the opportunity to become children of God, not of the flesh. But the word, Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, John says. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that. What does it mean that Jesus is the Son? Well, it means that He's full of grace and truth, just as God Himself is full of grace and truth. What is grace? Well, in that case, to be filled with grace means to give to others what they do not deserve. Have you ever received something you didn't deserve? Have you ever been given a gift that you know, really, <laughs> this is way too nice for me? Uh, I, I think almost anything I've ever been given was a grace because I didn't earn it or deserve it. And Jesus was filled with grace and it was most evident when he died on the cross. Because he lived the life that you and I cannot live. Free from sin, perfect in the sight of God, full of love and mercy and compassion. And when he died on that cross, he took your sins and mine and he gave us a precious gift that we couldn't earn. The gift of life. And so that Jesus, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory from the Father, full of grace and truth. He showed the glory of God in that He was filled with grace. In that everything that He did was a gift that was undeserved to those around Him. But He was also full of truth. I've never met someone full of truth. I've known a lot of good, honest people, but I've never met someone full of truth. Every word that he spoke was true, 
Every action that he took was genuine. Nothing that he said was deceptive or meant to mislead. The Son of God is full of truth. And so when you open up this book that we call the Bible and you read what is written here, you can know without doubt that it is true. There is no question that what we have is God's truth, that it cannot mislead or deceive unless man takes it and abuses it. Jesus the Son gave and showed glory of the Father and from the Father because He the Son is full of grace and truth. And that we see most of all in the cross. But also notice this, as the only Son, the one Son in the family of God, the inheritance is His. In Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, the writer says, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Jesus is the heir of all things, the one who has the inheritance. Now, I'm not yet a father. One day I hope to be. But I think it's true that fathers would like to leave a valuable inheritance to their family. Now, valuable can be defined in many different ways. But the kind of inheritance that I'm thinking about primarily is a legacy. A legacy of faith. A legacy of integrity, of hard work, of generosity, of kindness. But you know, I think that there are many fathers too who would like to know that when they're gone, their family is going to be taken care of, well provided for. And that God the Father over the spiritual family also has an inheritance prepared. Peter describes it in 1 Peter chapter 1 as undefiled, imperishable, and unfading. Prepared. But the inheritance belongs to the one son. He's the only son. You know, you're familiar with John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. John 1.14 says that he is the only son from the father. And as the only son, the inheritance is his. Well, you know, that, where does that leave us? There is one father. There is one son. But what about us? Didn't we sing that song, God's family? Aren't we part of the family too? Yes, because we've been given the right to be called children of God. And so I want to conclude here in the book of Romans, chapter 8. We're going to look at two sections here. The first is verses 13 through 15, as we see that we have been adopted into the family of God. One of my closest friends growing up was adopted. We didn't talk about it. Uh, to this day, we don't really talk about it. It's different for everyone, I'm sure. I don't know what that feels like in a physical sense. But my cousins both in Shelbyville are adopted. And though we haven't talked about it a lot, I know this that because they were adopted that they've been a part of a family that is well adjusted and that loves them. That both of them would not have been in that situation otherwise. And the same is true for you and me with our spiritual adoption. That if God had not adopted us spiritually we would be in a terrible situation. But because He has adopted us, we are free from sin. Because He has adopted us, we have life and hope. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, or even we could say children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, 
but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We've been adopted into the family of God. As Paul already made clear in Ephesians, as also is made clear in the passage we cited in John, through Jesus Christ, when, because of what he did for us on the cross, we are born again, believing that he is the Christ and being buried in water, being baptized, we are born anew. We become children of God. And what Paul says here is the spirit that we have received is the spirit of adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now there are many questions about the role of the Holy Spirit in this world, but this is made very clear. If nothing else is, his purpose is that we live holy lives as he is holy. And so it is through the Holy Spirit that we have adoption and by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And it is through the Holy Spirit that we remain in contact with our spiritual father as we live spirit-led lives. And so we have been adopted. We have been brought from death to life, from the worst possible spiritual circumstance, because any life spiritually outside of Christ is the worst spiritual life. But within Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. And therefore, as we have been adopted into the family of God, verses 16 and 17, we share in Christ's inheritance. Paul says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. When Christ died on the cross, he demonstrated once and for all his love for all mankind and also the truth that he is indeed the Son of God. God handed to him all authority. And according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one, at one day coming, Christ is going to hand that authority back to the Father. And when he does, we all... We all who are children of God through faith, having been born in the waters of baptism, we all will share in Christ's inheritance, an inheritance that will never fail or fade because God loved us enough to provide for us that gift. What a blessing it is to be able to say that we are part of God's spiritual family. What a blessing it is to know that we have a father who loves us and who is willing to give his only true son so that we could be called sons and daughters. What a gift to know that his one true son gave himself so that we could be his brothers and sisters. And so we are part of God's family. And I don't know about you, but one thing that I look forward to most of all is the reunion that is to come. One day we will be with our Father, Christ our brother who gave himself, and we will all share together in an inheritance that cannot fail or fade. There is one spiritual family made up of the one Father, the one Son, and you and me, the adopted children. So no matter what we may face here, we have the hope of a life together as a true family one day. Unless, of course, we've not yet received the Son. This morning, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're willing to turn away from your life of sin and confess His name, we'll be glad to baptize you for the forgiveness of sins. You can be born into God's family. Share in the hope, share in the, in the hope of life with the Father to receive the inheritance that Christ your brother died so that you could have. Or if you're a child of God and you need to confess some public sin or if you just want to come forward so that you can be encouraged by your Christian family, 
you're welcome to come as we stand and sing together.